When you read a book like the Song of Songs, your first reaction is, what is this book doing in the Bible? They certainly never taught it to me in Sunday school, and uh, there's no mention of anything spiritual in it from beginning to end. There's nothing about salvation, there's nothing about prayer or heaven. God isn't even mentioned once. In fact, there are two books in the Old Testament in which God is never mentioned once, and both happen to be romances. The other is Esther, which we'll be looking at later. But here is a book with nothing spiritual in it, and no mention of God. And uh, at first, for many years, I never preached from it. I didn't know what to make of it. I really didn't. And I, I think I'm not alone in that. Well, now let's begin with the title, Song of Songs. Uh, that's because Hebrew, as a language, doesn't include any adjectives. You can't say this is the most fantastic song, or this is brill, or whatever is the latest adjective. You can only use nouns, so instead of saying the greatest song, you say the song of songs. Instead of saying the highest king, you say the king of kings, or the greatest lord, the lord of lords. So song of songs means this is the best, this is the greatest. And maybe it is a great song, but why on earth is it in the Bible? It's not only not spiritual, but it's terribly sensual. Uh, it, it touches all your five senses. You smell, you can smell the apples and the raisins and the flowers and taste. You can taste those fruits and what are the others? Hearing, sight. I've missed one out. Touch. It's all there. It's a sensual song, full of senses. And uh, when it gets to an exact description of each other's bodies, the young man and the young lady in this song really get uh, quite uh, intimate, even excited. And as I told you, they never taught me this in Sunday school, but I began to get interested in this book just about the time my voice broke. <laughs> and it's probably very appropriate that we're studying it two days before St. Valentine's Day, February the 14th. So for years I never preached on it. I couldn't handle it. I thought, uh, well, it gave me a guilt complex. At one stage I bought so many commentaries, devotional expositions of this book, to try and find out some understanding of it. And this just increased my guilt complex because apparently it was all written in a hidden code and none of the words meant what I thought they meant according to these commentaries and <laughs> devotional expositions. And I think I touched rock bottom when I read one commentary commenting on a verse in chapter 1 where she says, my lover is resting between my breasts. And the commentator said, this means between the Old and the New Testament. <laughs> and I, I, I remember thinking, help, I am a most carnal Christian because when I read that phrase, the last thing I think about is the Old and the New Testament, you see? And uh, I thought God must have put this book in the Bible as a kind of catch-22 book to find out whether you were spiritual or carnal. And so I left the thing strictly alone. I heard that the rabbis treated it as a very holy book. They called it the Holy of Holies. And some rabbis even took their shoes off when they read it. That seemed to me quite extraordinary. So, what do we do with such a book? First thing I want to tell you is this, it is not an allegory. Now an allegory is in code. An allegory is a fictional story that someone's made up with a hidden message in it. And things are not what they seem on the surface. There's a hidden meaning behind it. I suppose one of the classic allegories would be Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, in which everything means something else, the house called Beautiful and the hill called Difficulty. And of course it's quite unreal, nothing is what it seems. Gulliver's Travels is another allegory. And there's a Church of England vicar who was convinced that Winnie the Pooh was an allegory, <laughs> an ecumenical allegory and that Winnie the Pooh was Anglican, a bearer of little brain, but the centre of everything that happened, and, and Rabbit, no, Piglet was Methodist, always hanging around with Winnie the, Winnie the Pooh, and Tigger was Pentecostal, always jumping up and <laughs> sort of frightening people with sounds that nobody understood. And, 
and they all belong to Christ of a Robin and finished up in the finished up in the enchanted place with him together. It was well worked out in the Church of England newspaper. But this is what an allegory is. It's a fictional story with a hidden meaning. And I'm afraid that's how most people have treated the Song of Songs. The trouble is, when they try and decode it, they all have a different code. They all come up with different meanings, and everybody sees what they want to see in it, and that didn't satisfy me at all. Why can't we take it in its simplest, plainest meaning? Well, because we think that's not very nice. The trouble is that we've been far more influenced by Greek thinking than Hebrew, and the Greeks never got it together. Life was always divided up for them between the physical and the spiritual, the sacred and the secular, always divided up like this, and they could never quite get the physical and the spiritual into one picture. And so the Greeks either became very spiritual people or very physical people, either very self-indulgent or really aesthetic. Now for Hebrews, there is one God who made the physical and the spiritual, and to the Hebrew mind, physical is good, whereas to the Greek mind, physical tended to be evil in itself. But if God, if a good God made this material world, then material things are good, and it was God who made us male and female and made it possible for us to fall in love and to be man and wife together. So we're talking not about an allegory, but about an affirmation. An affirmation. Write that down. Here in the middle of the Bible, God is affirming love between a man and a woman. He's saying, I did that, I thought it up, I made it. One of the biggest lies that the devil has spread around the world is that God is against sex and Satan is for it. Actually, the truth is the exact opposite. And the devil has convinced so many of this lie. It was God who made sex and it's Satan who's destroying it. That is the truth. So this is an affirmation in the middle of the Bible of human love. And the Bible says, don't call anything unclean that God has made clean. And it applies particularly here. Whenever I conducted a marriage, I always read part of the Song of Songs and told them to read the rest of it on the honeymoon. And uh, recently a vicar told me, he did the same thing, told a couple he'd like to read that at their wedding. They said, oh, you can't read that in church. <laughs> and there it is in the middle of the Bible. Well now, is that all the Song of Songs is? Is it simply an affirmation of human sexuality? No, it's something more. It is also an analogy, not an allegory, but an analogy. Now I've got to explain the difference. An allegory is a work of fiction with a hidden meaning, but an analogy is a fact, which is like another fact. Now this book, as I've told you, is a romance from beginning to end. It's a love story. It's written to you by someone who loves you more than anyone else. It is a love letter. When my wife and I moved house, we found, tied up in bundles, our love letters to each other before we married. And I opened a packet of mine to her and read one, and I was appalled that a man of average intelligence could write such drivel. <laughs> it ri you know, did you ever write Swalk on the back of an envelope, S-W-A-L-K? Those who don't know or need to be initiated into that, it means sealed with a loving kiss. And one young man told his girl, he said, whenever I get a love letter from you, I kiss the back of the envelope because I know it's had your lips on it. And she blushed crimson. And she said, well, actually, I moisten the flap on the dog's nose. <laughs> so all romance fled. But when we found our love letters to each other, they were falling to pieces. Now, that's not because we were married 300 years ago. It's because when you get a love letter, you read it and you read it and you read it. And I carried hers to me around in my RAF uniform in this pocket and any spare minute, pull it out and read it again. Now, when I get a brown envelope with a little window on the front, I don't do that with it, <laughs> especially if it says HM Revenue at the top, you know. But uh, I love letting you read and read again. Have you ever thought of looking at the edge of your Bible? Just look at the edge of your Bible closed 
and see where it's dirty. You ever tried that? It's a sobering thing. But you see, it's a love letter and it's to be read as a love letter. And it's the story of a romance of how God went looking for a bride for his son. That's what it's all about. And it finishes with a wedding. The whole thing is a love story, but here is a book right in the middle that is a love story. And romance is a key to reality. That's what this book is saying. Now, an analogy is when you say this, which is a fact, is like this, which is another fact. And Jesus was always using analogies. The kingdom of heaven is like. That's an analogy. Kingdom of heaven's like this or like that. He is starting with something that the people know and understand and saying what you don't know or yet understand is like this that you do. And the analogy in this book is very simple. The love between a man and a woman is like the love between God and human beings. The two are like each other. And of course the experience of human love is universal. 75% of pop songs are about love between a boy and a girl. It's the most common thing that we sing about, common experience to the whole wide world. And the Bible says your relationship to the Lord can be like that. You could be able to say of him, my beloved's mine and I am his. That's what it's meant to be like. It's an analogy. So we're going to use it as an analogy. It is a fact which illustrates another fact. Now, it was a real fact and it's written by Solomon who inherited from his father, his mother was Bathsheba, he inherited from his father a throne, a palace, a guitar and an ability to write lyrics. And the book of Kings tells us that he wrote 1,005 songs, of which we have about half a dozen in the Bible. So what happened to the other 999? Well, I've got a theory. It's only a theory, but see if it commends itself to you. I was taught in Sunday school that Solomon was the wisest man in the Old Testament. Did you ever hear that? And only much, much later did I find out he had 700 wives <laughs> and 300 concubines, 700 mothers-in-law. Would you call that wise? <laughs> and in fact, I discovered that Solomon was typical of many men. He had a lot of wisdom for everybody else, but not much for himself. Unfortunately, he didn't listen to himself. He preached, but he didn't practice. Now here's my theory. Of all those thousand women, only one was God's choice for him. Now he wrote 999 songs that are not published in the Bible. One that is, here's my theory. He wrote a song for each woman and God said, I'm only going to publish the one about the woman I chose for you. That makes sense to you? Anyway, we've lost all the others. Whatever they were like, they might have been not fit for publication. But this one was published by God. Now it says in the Song of Songs that he was already, well he already had 60 queens, he says, and concubines without number when he wrote this song. He was well on into his career. But this was the right one. This country girl from up north was the one that God wanted him to have and that he should have waited for. So God has not published any of the other songs at all. Now before we get into the Song of Songs itself, I must tell you that scholars are very divided about the plot. There is a plot here, but uh, some scholars say it is a plot of three people, a triangular tug of war or tug of love. We've got a shepherd boy, a king and the girl and she is torn between the love of the poor shepherd boy and the wealthy king, which shall she choose? And the whole Song of Songs is seen as this triangle and the girl in the middle wondering which way to go. Now it makes uh, an interesting plot and a jolly good sermon because you can finish the sermon with a moving appeal, you are that girl, will you choose the prince of this world or the good shepherd? See, good sermon and I'm afraid to me absolute rubbish because if, if, that, if that was the plot, 
then why on earth did Solomon write this song? Because he would be the baddie in that case. And there are many other reasons. The atmosphere in it is one of innocence, not of guilt, not of an evil king seducing this simple girl. That, that's a distortion. It, it's a, a pure, simple love song all the way through. Therefore, we must come back to a plot of two people. But then we have to explain why the boy talks like a shepherd and a king. Well, apart from anything else, many of the kings of Israel were shepherds first. It was a unique combination, the shepherd kings of Israel, that's combining the top and the bottom of the social ladder. The shepherd was the bottom. I mean, Jesse said to Samuel, when Samuel said, if you any more sons, well, only the shepherd boy. That's the bottom of the ladder. But uniquely, Moses was a shepherd before he became a leader of God's people. And David was a shepherd before he became king. So it's not an unusual combination, but there's more to it than that. This whole story, again, reads like a, a fairy tale, a romance that you'd read in a magazine. It's the old Cinderella syndrome. It's the Jane Eyre syndrome. It's the Daddy Longleg syndrome. Not many of your faces are lighting up. Do you, do you only read your Bible? <laughs> or Sound of Music, Sound of Music, you've all seen that. Well, it's a real, as I've said, Catherine Cookson, Barbara Cartland plot of the poor girl and the prince falls in love with her and the slipper fits and she's whisked off to the palace. That's the essential drama. But let's spell it out in detail. When you first read the Song of Songs, it's like taking the lid off a jigsaw box and seeing all the different coloured pieces mixed up inside. Now, I cheat when I do a jigsaw. I like doing them, but I like cheating. And what I do is I prop the picture up in front of me and then take a piece and move it around the picture <laughs> until I find where it fits and put it down. Now, that's cheating. Real jigsaw puzzle experts don't do that. In fact, they're often sent a box with no picture on the lid. And when you first read the Song of Songs, it's like opening a jigsaw box when there is no picture on the lid. And you see pieces, a whole lot of pieces of different colours. Well, I'm going to cheat tonight and I'm going to give you the picture on the lid. And then when you read it for yourself, the little bits will all fit into the picture. I want to begin by saying something that is said in the last chapter 8 in your Bible, which is that Solomon had a country estate on the slopes of Mount Hermon in the north. And when he was tired of kinging, he used to go and do some shepherding. And our royal family is somewhat similar. It's a good relaxation to get country clothes on and green wellies and go off into the country and pretend you're a country gentleman. Well, Solomon used to do this and he would take his crown off and put his jeans on and head north. And there on his country estate, he would take a few sheep out. And of course, in that country, you've got to lead the sheep to the grass. There aren't green fields like here, just a rocky mountain landscape with patches of green here and there. And you have to find still water for sheep because a sheep's nostrils are next to its nose. And if it's moving or rough water, it'll drown because it sucks up water into its nostrils. So you've got to find still water. So a good shepherd knows where there's green pasture and still water and he takes the sheep. Maybe 15 miles during a day. When the sun is up at midday, he has to make them lie down. And he does that by tying rope around their four feet. I've got a picture at home of the sheep lying down with their feet tied and uh, he makes them lie down in green pastures rather than exhaust them in the heat of the day. You know, the Good Shepherd does this with his flock too. Has he ever made you lie down? Well now, on Solomon's country estate at the slopes of Mount Hermon, there was a tenant farmer and he died. And the farm passed to his sons, we don't know exactly how many there were, three or four sons, and two daughters, one of whom was quite small, but the other was grown up. And that's the one in this song. And her life became one long drudgery. You see, the parents divided the estate and said to the sons, those are your vineyards, and to the daughter, that's yours. But her... The sons made her do all the work in the house and a lot of the work on the farm and she complained that she had to look after their vineyards so much 
that she neglected her own. Furthermore, something else happened to her which meant that she was likely to stay a slave to her brothers for the rest of her life. Her skin went darker and darker in the sun. Now here, that would be an attraction. We all head off for Spain to get a bit of sunshine. By the way, this is powder for the cameras. But um, we, we like a tan here. We like to darken our skin and come back thinking that's an asset. But in the Middle East, no, they keep a bride out of the sun for 12 months before the wedding to get her nice and pale. It's what they did to uh, Esther, Queen Esther. If you've got a very pale skin, don't get on the back of a camel in the Middle East or we'll see you disappear over the nearest sand dune singing the desert song and that's the, the end of you. So here was this poor girl getting darker and darker in the sun and therefore her prospects of marriage receding day by day and she thought, I'll never be free of my brothers. I'll, the rest of my life I'll be slaving for them. One day she's out in the fields and she meets a young man and they, they chat each other up, they like each other, arrange to meet the next day and the next and the next and after a fortnight they're deeply in love and they start saying all the silly things you, you do say when you're in love. Like, they talk to each other, all the bed we need is the green grass and all the roof over the heads we need are the cedars and the firs. That's how she talks before the wedding. Afterwards, it's a fitted bedroom and I don't know what else, but <laughs> before the wedding, why anywhere will do. The green grass will do for a bed and the trees will do for a roof. You do say odd things, don't you? And it's all there in the songs. And finally, the, well, the one thing that troubles her is she doesn't know who he is. And she keeps pestering him and saying, which farm do you come from? Where do you rest your sheep at midday? Where, and he says, well, you follow the tracks of the goats sometime, follow the tracks of the sheep. He evades the question and he will not tell her who he is. Anyway, she's deeply in love with him and he with her. And finally he says, will you marry me? And she has waited years for this. Gladly, yes, yes, yes. Well, he says, I've got some bad news. I've got to leave tomorrow. Because he said, I live and work in the big city in the south. He said, but I'll come back and marry you. You get ready for the wedding, but I'll leave you tomorrow and I'll come back for the wedding. For the next few months, in a very excited way, she's getting her bottom drawer ready and she never thought it would happen, but now it's terribly exciting. But she began to have nightmares and it doesn't take a very deep knowledge of psychology to interpret her dreams. All the dreams are centred on the theme of I've lost him and I'm looking for him. She's lying on her bed one night and she dreams that she's running through the streets looking for him and she meets the watchman and she says, have you seen the one I love? And, and they haven't and she runs around the streets, where is he, where is he gone? And she finds him and she gets hold of him and she drags him back, she says, to her mother's bedroom and says, I'm never going to let you go and she wakes up holding the pillow. Another time she dreamt that he was at the door and he was putting his hands through the door, the hole in the door, to lift the latch on the inside but he couldn't get it open because it was bolted further down. And have you ever had a dream where you're paralysed and you can't move? She has it in this dream and she can't get off the bed and he's trying to open the door and she's getting all frustrated because she can't move and his hand disappears and then she finds she can move and she runs to the door and she opens it and he's gone. Now, what's the explanation for these nightmares that she has lying on her bed? The answer is very simple. She's afraid he won't come back to marry her. She's beginning to think it was only a holiday flirtation, that he won't keep his promise. And then one day, one day, she's out in the fields and there's a great cloud of dust down the road and horses and chariots are coming up the road and she says to her brothers, who's that? And the brothers say, it's the king, it's the landlord, it's the king, King Solomon from Jerusalem, he's coming to visit his estates and they get ready to bow down low before the king and she's never seen him and she risks an eye and lo and behold, the young man in the big chariot, his hair young, young man, with a shock she realised because I mean everybody knows he's got 60 queens already, with a shock she realises she's number 61. 
and she's now got to go and leave the country farm and go and live in the palace. And when she does, when they're married and she appears at the first banquet, a banquet held to honour her, she's sitting at the top table next to the king and all these sixty beautiful fair-skinned queens in their robes are all round her. And she says, stop staring at me. She said, I got my skin this dark through having to look after my brother's vineyards. I can't help it. And she, she has a real inferiority complex. Furthermore, here's a very interesting little sidelight. She's constantly comparing herself with the other queens. See? If only Solomon had rated, waited for Miss Wright, when a man has more than one woman, those women begin to feel insecure and begin to compare themselves. You love her more than you love me sort of thing. The whole thing is just not God's will. If only he'd waited for the right girl and had one queen. That was God's will for him. But I'm afraid he had a bad example from his dad and from other royal households in that time and era. Now, she says, Solomon, can't we go back north? Can't we just lie on the grass under the trees? Couldn't we go and live on your estate up there? He says, no, I'm king and you have to be queen. You've got to reign with me here. And so finally, she says, but look at these beautiful women all around me. And he says, listen. In fact, she says with a tone of real inferiority, I'm just a rose of Sharon, I'm a lily of the valley. Now we think those are beautiful flowers, then go to Israel and have a look at them. They are tiny little flowers. You would never pick them. You would walk on them like daisies in a lawn. Lily of the valleys grow in the shadows, they're tiny things, and uh, the Rose of Sharon is a tiny little crocus that grows on the flat plain next to the Mediterranean. She says, I'm just a Rose of Sharon, just a lily of the valley. But the most beautiful flower in Israel is the lily, and that soars up. It's white and it's, it's got such a graceful form. It stands about this high. And he says, when she says, I'm just a lily of the valley, a rose of Sharon, she's putting herself down. But he says, like a lily among thorns is my darling among the maidens. And that so comforts her that she sings a little song to cheer herself up. And the song is, he brought me into his banqueting hall and his banner over me is love. He brought me into his banqueting hall and his banner over me is love. You know it? Yeah. Right, well, that's what she's saying to herself. Not quite that tune probably, but <laughs> nevertheless, that's what she's saying. And she has to come to terms with the fact that she's fallen in love with a king. Well, that's the outline of the story. That's the picture on the lid. Why then it is, is it in the Bible? Well, there are two answers to that, and these are the reasons why we should read it and study it. Number one, at the heart of our religion is a very personal relationship. And if you don't have that personal relationship, you've missed it. Being a Christian is not going to church, reading a Bible or supporting missionaries. Being a Christian is being in love with the Lord. The only point of singing hymns is that you're singing love songs. See, If you miss this, you've missed the whole thing. And here, right at the heart of the Bible, is this very intimate, loving relationship between Solomon and this country girl, and it's saying something very profound at the heart of the Bible is a very intimate, personal relationship. My lover is mine and I'm his. It is no accident that this is in the middle of your Bible because in the whole of the Bible, the relationship between God and people is presented in sexual terms. God and Israel, God is the husband, Israel is his wife, and he courts her and marries her at Sinai and enters into a covenant with her. And when she goes after other gods, she becomes an adulteress. It's all in there. You see, one day a prophet said to the Lord, what do you want me to do today? And the Lord said, uh, I want you to go and find a prostitute in the street. But I'm a preacher. Go and find a prostitute. What do you want me to do with her? Marry her. What then, Lord? Well, then you'll have three children. She will love the first one, but she won't love the second one. And the third one, Mr. Preacher, won't even be yours, so call it not mine. 
What do I do then, Lord? Well, then I'm afraid she's going to go back on the street to her old profession and leave me with the three kids. Yes. So what do I do about that? You go and find her and you buy her back from the pimp that's controlling her and you bring her back home and you love her again. And then what, Lord? Then go and tell my people Israel, that's how I feel about them. That's Hosea. There's Hosea in a nutshell. See, that's the whole relationship in the Old Testament between God and Israel. He woos her, wins her, loses her, still loves her, wants to get her back home again. Very personal relationship. When we move to the New Testament, exactly the same. Christ says, I am the bridegroom. He's looking for a bride and you are that bride. On the last page of the Bible, the bride is so eager for the wedding, she says, come. The bride says, come. She has made herself ready with white linen, which is righteousness. It's all there, you see. It's a love story beginning to end. And the Song of Songs expresses this relationship and what the young man says to the young girl in the Song of Songs, the Lord says to you. And what she says to him, you can say to him. And that's why many hymns and songs in our hymn books have come out of this song. It's not an allegory, it's not full of hidden meanings. Pomegranates means pomegranates and breasts mean breasts. God means what he says, but it's an analogy of the vertical relationship we can have. And the other thing is this, of course our relationship with the Lord is not erotic, it is emotional, it's not erotic, and there is a restraint in this song. It doesn't enter into the physical details that uh, modern minds would. There is a line of delicacy drawn. Nevertheless, it is an emotional relationship. I think of um, Jesus with Peter after Peter denied the Lord at a charcoal fire in a courtyard. The only other charcoal fire mentioned in the New Testament is a few weeks later in Galilee. And Peter saw that fire and he remembered. And Jesus said to him, Peter, I hoped you were going to be the first pastor, but I'm afraid you'll have to give out the hymn books now. Is that what Jesus said to Peter? No, he said, actually, you'll have to do 25 years in purgatory before you can get to heaven. No. No, he said, I'll put you on probation for a year and see how you make out, and if, if you make good, I'll reconsider you. No. He said, Peter, I can cope with you, provided I'm sure of one thing. Do you love me? The Lord doesn't ask you how many times you've been to church or how many chapters of the Bible you read this week. He says, do you love me? It's a love story. That's the most important thing. What's the summary even of the law? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and strength. Love your neighbour as yourself. Love really is as important as this. Now the other lesson, not only is your relationship with the Lord a very personal one, it's a very public one. Most people fall in love with the Lord because they see him as their shepherd, the one who will be with them in the valley of the shadow of death, the one who will lead them by the still waters and the green pastures. And then at some stage after you fall in love with Jesus as a shepherd who will look after you as a sheep, you wake up and discover he's a king and he's the king of kings and you're his bride and you're going to reign with him and be queen and you're in very public view. And that puts an extra responsibility on you that at times is pretty strong. You are his bride, you're royal family, you're the royal family of England. The future king of England is going to marry you. See, that alters the whole relationship somehow. And wouldn't it be nice if we could keep it private and just go back to the forests of Hermon? You know, and just keep secret your relationship with the Lord save a lot of unpleasantness, wouldn't it? A lot of criticism and a lot of exposure. Because as soon as you tell the people you work with, I'm a Christian, boy, they watch you like a hawk. They really do. And they expect you to be different. So isn't it much better to have a private relationship with Jesus? You can't. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords.
you fell in love with a king. You know, our queen mother never thought she'd be queen. She was a commoner, she wasn't royal, and she fell in love and married the stammering second son of King George V. And then because of King Edward abdicating, and I remember that, I remember hearing the broadcast, I was eight years old, uh, when he resigned from his crown for the sake of a twice divorced woman. It was a shattering blow, but nobody must have been shaken more than the Queen Mother. I think she's been the best queen we've had. Remarkable lady. She rose to it. She's got a royalty about her, though she was not born royal. But she became a queen for the sake of King George VI. And she's still queen. My, it's going to be a day when she dies, you know, the whole country will be in mourning. She rose to it. I had higher hopes for Charles and Diana because, you know, she said something when they got engaged that was so like the Song of Solomon. She was asked by the reporters, how do you think you'll cope with all the exposure and the publicity? And she said, as long as he loves me, I will cope. He brought me into his banqueting hall and his banner over me is love. And I'm afraid at their wedding, there were lip readers with telescopes watching them the whole day of their wedding. And when they stood on the balcony and he said, shall we kiss? And she said, why ever not? And he did. First time royalty had kissed in public in Britain, <laughs> so I'm told. How did anyone know what they said? There were people with telescopes on the Victoria Monument lip reading everything they said to each other. You see, once you're royal, everybody's going to watch you. And you have now a responsibility to live up to that whatever your background or birth. And this poor country girl found herself in a royal court with all the eyes on her. But uh, that was a calling. And that is your calling in Christ, not just to have an intimate personal relationship with Jesus, but a very public one that you live up to as royal family in England. What a message, the Song of Songs. Read Psalm 45 along with it. And uh, that's a very good psalm to go with it. It's a psalm from which our national anthem was taken. And it's all about being a royal princess, because that is our calling. Well, I hope that'll make the Song of Songs a little more interesting to you. <laughs>